partner here. Tonight I'll be reading from Romans 10, verses 14 through 21. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of, who, of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed, they have. For their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. But I ask, did Israel not understand? First, Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. Then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. But of Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, good evening. Hope that we are doing well tonight. My name is Trey. Um, I am on staff here at Mercy View. It's great to have you with us. Uh, just to welcome you again. Um, and just another plug for the men's hangout this Friday. Like, hey, if you're a dude, sign up in the back. Let us know you're coming. Come and hang out with us. We would love to uh, get a chance to know you, especially if you haven't had a chance to do that uh, yet. And so uh, it's going to be a good time. We're going to have some good food, just a, a good time of hanging out. Um, and we just want it to be a, an opportunity, not just to be unsophisticated and just hang out. We, we know um, that one of the things that we have not really done a great job of over the last couple years um, is taking time to just hang out as men here at the church. The, the ladies are definitely uh, beating us in that front, and uh, we uh, are grateful for the opportunity to do something like that. Um, hey, if you have your Bibles, leave them open to that passage we just read from in Romans chapter 10. We're going to uh, unpack what Paul has for us in verses 14 through 21 together this evening. Um, for the last few months, I've been walking with my kids through, we've, we've been reading uh, the Chronicles of Narnia. So we started with The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and we, we got to the end of that, and I was really excited because we got to watch the Disney movie that came out like when I was a kid. Like We got to watch that together, and, and, and we had a good time. And, and then we were going to read the next book and then watch the next movie, but that didn't happen. They saw there were extra movies, and so we watched the next two movies that were produced. Um, and so we are just now, even though we started Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe and finished it like early summer, we're just now like halfway through Prince Caspian, which is the second book. And, and as we were reading that Friday night, um, we were finishing up a chapter that uh, really just kind of stood out to me as I was thinking about this text that we're in here in Romans tonight. And it's this chapter where uh, Lucy and, and, and the kids, like all, all the kids that, that come to Narnia and this grumpy dwarf are, are trying to find... Uh, the place that the army is waiting on them, and they can't find it. And they've gotten lost in the woods. And, and as they're lost in the woods, they, they escape some folks who were shooting arrows at them, and, and they're sleeping under the stars. And Lucy hears this voice calling her. And she wakes up and she realizes that it's, it's not Peter, it's not Susan, it's not Edmund. Um, and she, she realizes that what's happening is Aslan is calling to her. Uh, Aslan, the, the great lion, the one who in... Lewis's allegory stands in for Christ, and she hears him calling, and so she makes her way through the woods, and, and, and the anticipation and the, 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 the story just kind of builds up until we get to this rapturous moment where Lucy enjoys, she sees Aslan in this clearing around these trees that are dancing and, and taking human form and going back and forth, and this is this beautiful picture, and she's overcome with joy. This fearsome yet lovely, good but not safe, great lion, Aslan himself, is standing there. And she runs, filled with joy, her heart full of relief that though everything's been scary, Aslan's right there. And then as she sits for a moment and she begins to talk to him, she realizes that in the previous day, she had really made a big mistake and it really broke Aslan's heart. She had saw him across the way, and instead of following him, she had went with her siblings. Instead of being bold enough to go the direction that they said, no, no, that's, that's not the right way. That's a fool's errand. She goes with them, and she goes along. And in this moment, Aslan's like, yeah, hey, I'm a, I'm a little sad about that. He's like, but I have a task for you. You have to go back to the camp tonight. 
And you've got to wake up your siblings. You've got to wake up that grumpy dwarf. And you've got to tell them that they need to follow you here in the woods to me. And she's like, okay, that sounds a little daunting. And so she asks, she says, okay, will the others see you too? And he says, certainly not at first. And later on, it depends. And she responds, but they won't believe me. And Aslan says, it doesn't matter. And after a brief back and forth, she buries her head in his mane. And she says there must have been magic in it because she comes out with courage that she didn't have before. And they walk to the edge of the wood together and she can see the camp. And Aslan looks at her and he says, now child, I'll wait here. Go and wake the others and tell them to follow. If they will not, then you at least must follow me alone. And so she goes. And she does something that is really, really difficult. She tries to wake up four people who are dead asleep and dog tired and convince them to follow her down a more challenging path, following a lion that they can't see. And their response is what you would expect. And if you're familiar with Lewis's story, then you know that he, he wrote it as an allegory. And, and so what happens in this story is we read through that story, we see all these little pieces that he's pulling out in this, this grander story that he's trying to tell. Like he's not just trying to tell a story about this land called Narnia far away that you can find through a wardrobe or that you can get sucked into through a painting. He, he's trying to tell us that in this fictional world, there is something about our world and our reality deeper that we need to see. And in this little snippet, I think we get a great glimpse into the heart of the text that we're unpacking here tonight in Romans chapter 10. You see, as we dive into this last section of Romans 10, we're, we're in the middle of Paul explaining a, a daunting task that stands before believers, explaining God's purpose of election, his, his choosing to have mercy on sinful people, and trying to help us make sense of Israel, God's covenant chosen people who he had revealed himself to, he had revealed his law to, rejecting Jesus as their Messiah. And Paul is heartbroken over the reality that there are people who from the, the lineage of those who were given the law, who heard the prophets, who knew or should have known the one true God, they have not done what we saw last week. They haven't confessed with their mouth and believed in their heart that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead and that he now sits and reigns at God's right hand. And so as Paul's writing here in chapter 10, he's anticipating that this reality, it's causing a bit of anxiety on the part of his hearers in Rome. Because they're thinking, man, if, if Israel didn't believe, then how is anyone else going to believe? And also, if if God, who had made this covenant with Israel, if he could pass over Israel and, and bring it to us, like Gentiles, those outside the covenant, like they're, they're familiar enough like to know that this seems like maybe, maybe, just possibly, is God going to be unfaithful for us too? And so Paul's trying to wrestle with this and he's trying to help them hold this tension this tension between God and his choosing to save and show mercy and Israel's choosing and rejecting and culpability for their sin. That's what's happening in chapters 9 through 11 in our text tonight. It fits right in the middle of that. And we could spend all of our time together, and, and as I prepare this week, we nearly did, unpacking the complexities of this section and how the overall context and the thrust of the passage, it's, it's got less to do with missions, which is normally what we preach about when we preach from Romans 10, 14 through 15, right? How are they going to hear? How are they going to know? It's got less to do with that, and it's got more to do with Paul saying, hey, here is what has happened, and here's why Israel is still responsible for their rejection of Jesus as a Messiah. And that's true, and it's right, and, and we could spend our time there. But as we unpack this, there's a reality that for the last 2,000 years, you've, and, and probably in your life, if you've grown up in the church, you've heard this message talked about in a way from this text where we're talking about 
what it means to preach the gospel. And I got one shot to preach this text this week. And so instead of unpacking all of the the complexities that are there, I want to take the angle that maybe you're expecting when you read Romans 10, 14 through 15. But it's an important angle that we have to look at. And it's this. If as we saw last week, we need a righteousness that comes through faith and not a righteousness that comes from the law. A righteousness that's rooted in confessing and believing, not in working and striving then how do we get this righteousness that comes from faith? That is the central animating question that we have to answer tonight. And it's the answer that lies in the heart of this text in verse 17. And I'm going to answer the question right now. Because in answering the question, we got a couple more that come up. Here's verse 17. You can look at it with me. Paul says, So faith comes from hearing... And hearing through the word of Christ. And in the previous passage, he's already unpacked that we have to have a righteousness that comes from faith, not a righteousness that comes from what we do. This is the hinge of the passage, and it brings more questions in giving us the answer. Righteousness that comes by faith comes from hearing the Word of God. And so there's two things in relation to this that we need to see, that we need to unpack together this evening. First, we need to take a look at verses 14 through 16, where the questions that have driven mission for the last 2,000 years are being asked. Okay, if faith comes by hearing, then how do people hear? What is the means, what is the method, what is the way of grace that God uses to save sinners from their sin through faith. And then after that, we need to understand the dynamics at work within the human heart, within your heart, within my heart, within the hearts of those that hear the gospel. And when the means of grace is accepted or rejected, we need to understand what that says about us and what it says about God. So that's a little bit of a roadmap for where we're going. Let's start here, though. What's the means, what's the way that God has chosen to save sinners through faith. In verses 14 through 15, we get a series of questions. Paul is is, is here in this this section setting up an argument for some of the objectors to whether or not Israel really is responsible for their sin. And he's going to dismantle the objections and, and show us that they are. But as he does this, we get this glimpse into the method for how faith that leads to righteousness through confessing with our mouth and genuine belief in our hearts comes about. Remember, he said in verse 13 that we looked at last week, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so the question, the objection is, verse 14, how then will they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how are they to believe in the one in whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they're sent? And these are great questions. Like they make a lot of sense and they're true. Like no one can call on the name of the Lord if they first haven't believed that Jesus is the Lord and that God raised him from the dead. But they can't believe that if they hadn't heard the gospel. And who is ever going to hear the gospel unless someone proclaims it, unless someone preaches it to them? And who is going to go and preach unless they're sent by those who already have the gospel to those who don't? Now, his immediate point is this. God has already answered each of these questions as it relates to ethnic Israel. Like, we work backwards through the text and through the questions. We see that he has sent preachers. Like, countless times throughout their history, he has sent preachers. And in Paul's day, he sent preachers. He sent messengers to preach the gospel. And Israel's response has been one of just shutting their ears. They've had those who have come and they've preached and they've heard about the Lord Jesus in whom they are to believe and find life, yet they haven't believed. And, and, and we'll get to those questions next. That's the second section we need to look at. But first, I, I want us to answer this question. How does the gospel 
go from those who have received it to those who need it. Another way of asking, another way of looking at it is this. What is the means, what is the method that God has chosen to use to take the good news of what Jesus has done to lost and hurting people who need it so that they find salvation and hope in the only place that you can find it, in Jesus Christ? And our objector has already answered the question. He sends preachers. He sends heralds of the gospel. He sends messengers of the hope of the world. Don't get hung up on the word preacher. Like, I, I think we need to think a little bit more about this as in, in terms of heralding the gospel. So uh, maybe you've watched a movie set in like, I don't know, any time between like 1,000 and like 1,200 AD, right? And, and you have uh, this guy in robes and he's standing on the free, street corner and there's people listening and he says, uh, what's it? By order of the king, right? Something like that, right? And he, he's playing the role of a herald. He's standing, he's proclaiming with a loud voice something the king has said. And it's what the Greek word uh, kiriso used here for preacher literally means. A preacher in this sense is one who is heralding the good news. They are those who are sent by a king or an official to announce and proclaim that something has happened or that something has been decreed. And ever since sin has entered the world, God has been sending and has been preaching the gospel. Like God himself preaches the gospel in Genesis chapter 3. As he pronounces the curse on the serpent, and he tells Eve that from her line there's going to come one who's going to crush the head of the serpent. He sends heralds to proclaim the good news again and again throughout history. And one of the ways that he accomplishes this then and now is he calls certain people to the work of vocational ministry. There are those who are called to be missionaries and to take the gospel to unreached people around the world. There's those that he calls to be pastors and preachers who, who do what I'm doing tonight. To stand before the church. To proclaim, to herald the good news, to, to proclaim the hope that God has created a way for man to be made right with him. That he, he stepped off of his throne. That he was in heaven and he came to earth in the person of Jesus Christ. And he came and he, he lived the life that you couldn't live and he died the death that you deserve to die. That God raised him from the dead. It's the thing that we got to believe that we saw last week. But professional ministers aren't the only preachers that God sends. Like, think about Jesus' ascension. Now, there's over 500 people that see him ascend into heaven and that hear him give the Great Commission. And we got that recorded in a couple places. You think Mark 16, you think Matthew 28. And, and Jesus tells those that are there, go and preach the gospel and make disciples. Like, not all 500 of them were apostles, not all 500 were elders, not all 500 were deacons. They weren't all called and qualified to be professional ministers, but they were all charged to preach the gospel and to make disciples. And so you might not be called to be a herald of the gospel in the same way that I'm doing tonight, but at home with your kids, you are to be preaching the gospel. Like at the coffee shop with your friend, you are to be preaching the gospel. At work with your coworkers, as you're having conversations and you're talking about life and you're talking about the struggles in life that you face, you are given the opportunity and the call to preach the gospel. Like I'm struck by just how yesterday I failed to actually recognize that God was giving me an opportunity to preach the gospel. Like I got rear-ended yesterday and I got out and I acted a little foolishly. I like threw my hands up and got a little mad at the guy because the kids were in the car and I was mad and I was upset. And somebody's like, hey dude, it's an accident. And I'm like, you're right. I need to calm down. And we had this great conversation and, and he was like, man, you don't have to keep apologizing. I understand it. And I'm like sitting here thinking to myself, oh no, I need to keep apologizing because I'm not representing Christ, but I didn't say it. But God had given me an opportunity yesterday to preach the gospel. To show grace and mercy to the guy who rear-ended me. 
And I didn't realize until I was looking over my notes today that I missed it. That God calls us and gives us opportunities to proclaim the wondrous saving work of Jesus in every single minute moment of our life. He's constantly bringing us opportunities. The means, the method that God has chosen to use to save sinners is the preaching and proclamation of the word, of the story of Jesus. You might have heard the often misattributed um, quote that, that people throw around for St. Francis of Assisi, preach the gospel, use words if necessary. But besides the fact that he never actually said that, um, there's also the fact that like, God wants you to preach the gospel at all times, and he wants you to use words because words are very necessary for preaching the gospel. But you can't preach, you can't proclaim with confidence and assurance something that you don't speak. And yes, our lives and our actions and the way that we love our spouse, the way that we treat our kids, the way that we interact with our coworkers, the kind of joy that we should carry with us, like it should speak a word. But if we never actually open our mouth and proclaim the reason for the hope that we have, they're not going to know. A faithful presence, being a Christian and doing what you do wherever it is well and with integrity, like it's a good thing, it's a crucial thing. Sometimes it earns you a hearing. But God is still calling us to preach the gospel with words. Look at what Paul says in verse 15. He quotes from Isaiah. He says, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Each of us, whether we stand in this spot or not, God means for us to be people with beautiful feet. R.C. Sproul in his commentary on Romans uh, helps us understand what that means. Like, what, what's that from Isaiah that he's quoting? What's he talking about? Uh, in ancient Israel, uh, uh, when the kings would go off to war, the, they would have a watchman placed at the city in the tower, and they would be looking out into the distance to see the direction of the battle. And depending on how the battle was going, the, the king would send a messenger back to the city to relay the information. And before the messenger ever got there, while he was still a long way off, the watchman could tell whether or not the news that he was bringing was good or it was bad. If it was bad news, as he made his way back to the city, his stride would be long and it would be slogging as he makes his way back to town to deliver the bad word. But if the message was good and things were going well, the person in the watchtower could see in the distance the dust kicking up from his feet as he runs with all of his might and all of his strength to make it back and tell them that the battle was going well. There was joy and there was a lightness in the way that he carried himself. He's bringing good news. Friends, God's means of saving sinners is to send messengers whose feet kick up the dust as we go. The joy of the Lord rooted in the gospel should constantly be filling our hearts and it should be slightly annoying to your coworkers and to your friends who don't know Jesus. They should be really confused about how, how in the midst of the grind you can have joy. How in the midst of all the things that happen there can be something different in you and it gives you the space and the hearing to say, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me talk to you about the reason that I can endure. We should be kicking up the dust every time we walk in a room because we carry with us the best news of all. Sin is defeated. Death is swallowed up in victory. And Jesus reigns. And there's more. And he invites us to enjoy life in his kingdom now and in eternity. And we preach, because as we see in verse 17, faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. 
Still, though, there's, there's the matter of verse 16, which I did skip, in case you were paying attention. Verses 18 through 21 and verse 16. We've got to deal with those because they're here in the passage. God sends those who have heard and believed the gospel to preach the gospel. And through preaching, which Paul describes in 1 Corinthians as something that's foolish. I don't know if you've ever thought about what it is that I'm doing right now, standing up here talking for 35, 45 minutes. But, I mean, there's no other thing in life that you go and do every week like this. And it's just kind of seems a little foolish, right? And God has ordained it as the means by which he saves sinners. He says in verse 16, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he's heard from us? We got to deal with the fact that Israel has rejected the gospel. And that's the context of the entire passage. And so we got to contend with it because Paul is contending with it. And he's focusing in on this. And so it, it leaves us with a question. Like, in one sense, it would have just been really easy. Like, and it would have felt really good if just a moment ago, when I got to the end of verse 17 and read that, we just said, okay, we're done. That's all we got to look at. Go be people that carry joy, that kick up the dust, take the good news. But we got to deal with this. Partly because Paul does, and partly because what happens when you go and carry the good news into your home or into your workplace or into these places that God would call you, and like Israel, they've not all obeyed. And we ask with Isaiah, Lord, who has believed what he's heard from us? And so Paul zeroes in on Israel, and, and we're left wondering, okay, why, why do we got to spend this time here? And, and pastor author John Piper, uh, he wrestled with the same question about 20 years ago as he preached through Romans. And actually, as he was preaching through the text we read last week, he asked his church the same question. He says, why are we spending so much time in the 21st century, like in America, focusing on Israel, in particular, ancient Israel? Why do we care about their response to the gospel 2,000 years ago? And he makes this point, and, and, and he says, this is why Paul's spending time here, and this is why we should spend time here. Because as we look at Israel, and this is a direct quote, we see the historical microcosm of the world's conscience, of your conscience. And he goes on, Israel is the historical theater where the drama of every human soul is played out for all to see. What goes on inside you spiritually and every other person has gone on in Israel historically. And the story is told so that we can see ourselves and see the world. If you want to know your own spiritual condition before God as a human being, if you want to know the greatest issues for all the world, you can learn it from watching the history of Israel as it's interpreted in the Bible. And so here's the point that, that Piper is making, is that what looking at Israel here in this text does for us, what it shows us, is how the story of our lives is running parallel to the story of Israel. Like from their wanderings in the wilderness to the very moment that Paul has written, if we are to examine their history, what we would see is a mirror into our own souls. Israel is disobedient. We're very often disobedient. They're unfaithful. We're very often unfaithful. They're idolatrous. They're arrogant. They're hard of hearing. And they have these moments in their agony when they'll cry out to God. But it's either short-lived before they return to their idols or before they start to trust their own righteousness, their own ability to be good and right before God and looking to that for salvation. See, there's this bent in every one of our hearts that goes the same way. And so the picture that Paul paints in Romans 9 through 11, and particularly here in verses 14 through 21, is a picture of how sinful people have a moral culpability, a moral responsibility for their sin as they harden their hearts and close their ears. 
That was the case for the vast majority of the Jewish people in the first century. And it might be the case for some of us here tonight. And so in verse 18, Paul continues and he quotes from the psalmist, he quotes from Moses, and he quotes from Isaiah. And he says, look with me at verse 18. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed, they have, for their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. But I ask, did Israel not understand? First Moses says, I'll make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I'll make you angry. Then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I've been found by those who didn't seek me, and I've shown myself to those who did not ask for me. See, at this point in time, as Paul is writing, the gospel has really spread across the Roman world at this astonishing clip. Like from day one, there have been people going into at least 16 different regions of the Roman Empire and sharing the gospel. Like Peter preaches his first sermon, 3,000 people get saved, and that's how many regions are represented by the people who heard. And so I think it's right then and good for us to assume that they're carrying the gospel with them. And if Paul's like modem operandus, when he goes into a place, is what other missionaries would do. Like the missionaries that are going out from Jerusalem are going to the synagogues first. And they're going to the people of Israel who are waiting for their Messiah. And they're saying, guys, we found him. He's here. But Paul says they've hardened their hearts. And so the quote in verse 18 is from Psalm 19. And it speaks to the way in which creation has been preaching for ages and singing the praises of God and proclaiming the good news. And then in verse 19, he begins to draw from Deuteronomy 32 and he says, hey, I'm going to call this to stand in opposition to the people of Israel because what Moses says is that those outside the covenant have now believed what Israel is rejecting. And then down in verse 20, he continues throwing shade on the fact that they're waiting anxiously For their Savior, who has already come and already made himself known. And while they stand out in the cold, they're like the older brother from the prodigal son. The younger brother's already inside eating. They're welcome to the feast and they're not wanting to come in. And so then we get down to verse 21. And this is the thread that begins to tie it all together. Paul quotes from Isaiah 65, verse 2. Where God says, all day long, I've held up my hand to disobedient and contrary people. Isaiah portrays God as being patiently, kindly, lovingly, standing with arms open to receive Israel from the day that he called them his own. And time and time again, what they've done is they've rejected him. They've spurned his kindness. They've cast off his pleas to come in and repent and in humility seek his face. And sometimes they've turned to idols. Sometimes they turn to foreign kings. Sometimes they turn to their own self-righteousness that assumed that they could keep the letter of the law without drawing near to the giver of the law. And friends, this is the picture that Paul gives us and that is before us today. It's before those of us who would say, I've confessed that Jesus is Lord. I've believed in my heart of hearts that he died for my sins and that he rose again and he's seated at God's right hand and I'm willing to go and be a messenger. But what if they don't listen? And like Aslan says to Lucy, It's the same thing that Jesus says to Peter, and it's what Paul would say to us if he were here tonight. It doesn't matter. Go. And if they don't listen, you follow me alone. Friends, this is the picture we have before us today. It's before those of us who would say, listen, for so much of my life, I've rejected God's outstretched hands. But there's something about the proclamation of this good news that I can't fully explain, but it's gripped my heart, and I want to know more about this good news and about this hope for life that you say is found in Jesus. 
If that's you, we, as we close our time down, as we come to an end, there's going to be some of us that are going to be standing up here at the front on either side. We're, we're restarting our prayer team. And, and it's not just for folks who maybe feel like they want to respond to the gospel. It's for anybody who needs prayer during our communion time. But if that's you and you're like, I have heard the gospel. I don't understand any of it, but I want to know more. We would love to talk to you and explain it to you. This is a picture that we have before us today. Before those of us who may be sitting in the seats tonight and you're convinced that you have no need for this would-be Jewish Savior who was tortured and killed like 2,000 years ago, who we proclaim has raised from the dead, and of which you are not in the slightest convinced. Because you think that on Judgment Day, if there even is such a thing, and after death there's not just an empty void, if there is a Judgment Day, whoever or whatever stands there, he's going to be content with what you have to offer. And friend, if that's you, the God who took on human flesh and died for your sins stands here with outstretched hands tonight. And I'm begging you, don't harden your heart. As we bring our time this evening to a close, I want us to, for a moment, return to that dark Narnian forest where Lucy Pevensey and the great lion Aslan stand at the edge of the wood. And she's about to take the daunting step of telling her siblings and a grumpy dwarf that she has seen Aslan. And they have to follow her to him, though they can't see him. They must follow her as she follows him down the path that that they have to take, even though it's more treacherous than the one they think that they should go and that they're already on. And as she stands there, Aslan's just told her that regardless of what they say, she nonetheless must follow him. That's all that she can do. And so she takes a deep breath and she starts the journey back to camp. And here Lewis writes, It's a terrible thing to have to wake four people, all older than yourself and all very tired, for the purpose of telling them something they probably won't believe and making them do something they certainly won't like. And she was right. It was a pretty terrible thing because she goes and she tries to wake her older brother Peter first and she thinks that he hears and that he responds with affirmation but he rolls over and he's just still fast asleep and then she goes to Susan, the one she really doesn't want to go to and Susan wakes up, looks at her and says, you're being a silly girl, go back to bed, you didn't hear anything. She passes over the dwarf because nobody wants to wake up a sleeping dwarf And at last, she gets to her brother, Edmund. And if you know the earlier story, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, you know that Edmund, he's the second person to find Narnia. He doesn't believe Lucy. He thinks she's making it all up. But he goes, and and actually, he gets there, and he meets the White Witch. And he believes her lies, and he betrays his brothers and sisters. And in the end, he has to have Aslan die on the stone table for him. And so Lucy wakes Edmund up, and Edmund is tired, and he's grumpy. But he remembers what it was like not to believe Lucy. And so he says, I'll believe you. He remembers all that Aslan had done for him in the past. And so he says, whether the others follow you, I guess I'm going to follow with you too. I don't see him, but I'm going to follow you as well. And in the story, as they they get up and they all begin to follow, even though they don't want to, they travel along a path that seems more dangerous than the one they have been on. At first, Lucy's the only one who can see Aslan. And she has her eyes fixed on him, and the others are fixed on her. But as they continue down the path, one by one, their faith begins to grow. And Edmund, he can see Aslan in the distance and he shouts with joy. And then then Peter can finally see him and he runs ahead toward him. And then finally at the end, Susan and the dwarf see Aslan come into view. This is a children's story and because of that, every character ends up seeing the great lion. But 
the parallel here, the thing that I want us to see is that regardless of whether or not they had all seen, he'd still said, go. See, Aslan stands in the allegory in place of Christ. And regardless of if the people that he's called you to go and preach the gospel to follow, he says, go. And you never know what's going to happen as you go and you proclaim the truth of the gospel. As you walk down your path and your eyes are fixed on Christ, as you make your way down the narrow way, the hard way, those who do follow along behind you, the Lord may open their eyes to see him and rejoice with everything in them. How then will they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how are they to believe in the one whom they've never heard? How are they to hear without someone preaching? How are they to preach unless they're sent? Because, friends, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. Let's pray.